Hey folks, Ben Starr here from MasterChef Season 2, and I know, I know, you don't have to apologize. You have a bad relationship with Thanksgiving turkey. Maybe it's because your grandmother used to make the driest turkey ever, and you'd put a bite in your mouth and it would just curl up into a ball of sandpaper and sit in the back of your throat, and no amount of iced tea in the world can wash it down. Or perhaps you have been surprised with the information a day or two before Thanksgiving that you will be hosting friends or family for Thanksgiving unbeknownst to you until that moment. Perhaps you have seen all of this ridiculous information about how complex it is to brine a turkey. You have to get a giant gallon, uh, two gallon, three gallon stock pot and boil your brine and then cool it down. Find some way to chill it in the refrigerator and that all just seemed overwhelming to you. Well, today I am coming to your rescue with the most simplified way to brine and roast a Thanksgiving turkey. And you only have to start the day before Thanksgiving. Now, I'm going to confess. I started making this video yesterday because I was going to teach you how you can thaw and brine your turkey in one step by putting it into the brine and letting it thaw in the brine. Guess what happened? The turkey sat in the brine for 17 hours and it's still frozen solid! So, I learned something today. You cannot thaw a turkey in brine. That's because brine lowers the freezing temperature of whatever it is, and so the liquid inside my brine was at 29 to 30 degrees with the frozen turkey in it, keeping it that cold, and the turkey is still hard as a rock 17 hours later. I'm glad that didn't happen to be on the set of MasterChef. So what we're going to do is mostly thaw our turkey via the rapid method in iced water, and that's going to have our turkey thawed out enough to go into the brine and finish thawing the rest of the way in about three to four hours. So you definitely want to start this step on the day before the turkey is served. Now let's quickly talk about turkeys. There's a whole bunch of different types available on the market. You can actually buy frozen turkeys at a nice grocery store, but it's going to be more expensive, like four to five dollars a pound. Whereas you can get a frozen turkey on sale for 29 to 39 cents a pound sometimes when the specials run the week before Thanksgiving. It's okay to get a frozen bird. You just have to thaw it mostly before you put it into the brine. What you do not want to do is brine a turkey that says self-basting or deep marinated or kosher turkey. These turkeys have already been brined and then they've been frozen. So when you thaw them out, all of the brine is going to come out of the individual cells of meat. It's going to be gross. So do not buy one of those types of turkeys, period. Especially don't try to brine one. Uh, a turkey that has been enhanced with a solution of water, broth, and sodium phosphate, it's actually okay to brine those turkeys because your brine is going to be so salty that it's going to strip that brine out of the turkey and put your brine in. So it's okay to use one of those turkeys. You've just technically overpaid for it because you're paying a little bit extra for that water, broth, and sodium phosphate. You're paying the same price for that as you are for the turkey. But anyway, that's actually what I've got here. This turkey is pretty frozen solid, and inside the turkey cavity are all sorts of things like a package of, of giblets or, or you know organ meats. There's also a package of like gravy mix or something like that, and we don't want that. But we can't get it out right now because the turkey is still frozen solid. So here is how you quick thaw a turkey. The first thing that you need to do is sterilize your sink because anytime we're working with poultry, we want to make sure everything is sanitary. And you sterilize your sink by filling it up with hot water, add a cup of bleach, let it sit for five or ten minutes, drain it out, and then rinse it. That way we know that there are no pathogens floating around in this water. Now we're going to fill up the sink with cold water here. And we're going to place our turkey right inside. Now, if you've got one of those gigantic, like, 24-pound turkeys, it may not fit in your sink. You may have to do this, actually, in your bathtub. Uh, but hopefully, you've got it, uh, a turkey that's small enough to fit in your sink. If you do end up doing this in your bathtub, you want to leave the turkey inside its package while you thaw it. It's going to take longer to thaw out that way, and it's going to be a real pain. But uh, your bathtub, probably you can't get clean enough in order to make it sanitary for a turkey. As the water level gets higher, you'll notice that your turkey has started to float. And that's what you're looking for. You can stop the water at that point. Now you're going to turn the turkey breast side down. That means the flat part where you can see the base of the wings 
is facing up towards the sky. And then you're just going to take a 10 pound bag of ice and set it on top of that turkey. That's going to keep it underneath the surface of the water. And the ice is also going to help keep the water cold so that the turkey thaws rapidly. Now according to the USDA, it's going to take 30 minutes of thawing time in this cold water per pound of turkey to get it thawed. That means a 12 pound turkey is going to take 6 hours to thaw out in this water. You can actually speed up that process by leaving your faucet on at a slight trickle. That keeps the water circulating around the turkey and it thaws a bit faster. And we also don't have to totally thaw our turkey before we put it in the brine. I have brined half frozen turkeys before and they've turned out just fine. Did you know that you can also put a whole frozen turkey into the oven to roast? The USDA just recommends you roast it for 50% longer. I've never tried that and I don't want to risk ruining a turkey, but if you're looking at this video on Thanksgiving Day with a frozen turkey, you might just want to try it out and see what happens. The internet is riddled with information about how eating a turkey is going to kill you. Either you have thought it in an inappropriate way and bacteria have just blossomed inside and it's going to kill you, or you've undercooked your turkey and it's going to kill you. Let me tell you, if you cook a turkey to the proper temperature, all of the pathogens inside it will be dead. And as, we, as I'm going to show you when we roast our turkey, we're going to use a thermometer to determine the exact temperature at which the turkey meat is done and is safe to eat. So even if you have had a slight bacterial buildup because your water wasn't exactly 34 degrees when it was freezing, or your brine was a few degrees above 34 degrees, you're not going to die, people. The USDA is in the business of keeping you from doing something stupid, like pouring hot water over your turkey and letting it sit there for an hour to thaw. Of course, that's going to cause a lot of bacterial buildup, but you know what? If you still cook it to the proper temperature, it'll still be safe. I am in the business of giving you solid information that will help you not go crazy preparing your Thanksgiving turkey. So, if you will cook your turkey to the proper temperature during the roasting phase, don't worry about thawing it in cold water. You're not going to have any problems. And don't worry about brining it. The brining environment is acidic, it is salty, and it is cold. Bacteria do not like those things. At least the bacteria that normally inhabit poultry meat that can make us sick if we ingest it, like Salmonella and Campylobacter. But, like I said before, the roasting process kills all of that. Okay, so it's been about five hours and my 12 pound turkey is pretty well thawed. At least thawed enough for me to go ahead and start the brining process. So I'm going to pull it out here. And a couple of things before we get it into our brine. My turkey has this metal truss hook that is kind of holding the legs in place. And uh, that would be nice if we were just taking the turkey straight into the oven. But we're about to immerse it in a salty, acidic solution. And you know what happens when you immerse metal into a salty, acidic solution? It corrodes or rusts. And I really don't want that then penetrating into my turkey because it's probably not going to taste very good. So I am going to take a pair of pliers because I've tried to take these things out and they can be a real pain in the butt to try to remove. So I'm just going to try to cut that with my pliers. Yeah, beautiful. That work, that's actually much easier than trying to pinch these out. I don't know how they get these buried in there. Now, if your turkey has a plastic one, you can just leave it on, and it can even bake with that piece of plastic in there. It's a heat-resistant plastic. Okay, so my metal truss is coming out nicely. Inside the cavity of the turkey, we've also got some goodies, or at least the meat packer thinks that they're goodies. This is turkey gravy. I don't know what that is. I'm going to throw it away. Also on the inside we have got a neck and a little bag of giblets and I'm going to go ahead and take those out as well. You may end up having to run some lukewarm water in there if there's some remaining ice crystals keeping that packed in, which there is. It actually took about five minutes of flushing that interior cavity out with lukewarm water in order to get the neck out because it was pretty frozen in there. Make sure you look in the opposite section or the opposite cavity of the turkey for the bag of giblets. Now it's not always going to be there. It depends on the manufacturer. But yes, so here's our bag of giblets and this is used traditionally to make gravy. It's the heart and the gizzards 
and the liver of the turkey. It makes a delicious gravy. So keep these if you're going to use them. Okay, let's talk about brining vessels. Most professionals will tell you that you need to brine in your refrigerator. But it's Thanksgiving. There's no room in my refrigerator. It is best, in my opinion, to brine inside an ice chest. And you can get a regular disposable ice chest like this at the grocery store for a few dollars and use it for several years, then recycle it and get a new one. The important thing here is that you sterilize the interior of your ice chest. And you do that just like we sterilized our sink. Fill it up with hot water, pour in a cup of bleach, let it sit for five minutes, and then rinse it out. Then it's sterilized and it's good to go. Now you ideally want to use an ice chest that is approximately the size of your turkey. You don't want to brine a turkey this big in a giant you know, 40 gallon cooler because then you're going to waste a whole lot of brine. Uh, but if that's the only thing you have, it's the only thing you have. However, I would encourage you to get one of these smaller picnic coolers because it's the perfect size for our turkey. Okay, so what we're going to do first is put our turkey inside the cooler. Now we're going to calculate how much brine we need to make. Our brine today is going to have only four ingredients. Now you're going to see all sorts of ridiculous recipes on the internet for steeping bay leaves and fresh garlic and rosemary in a hot pot and then cooling it in the fridge. Let me tell you something. I have tried incorporating all sorts of flavors into my brine. And do any of them ever end up tasting inside the turkey like they taste themselves? No. So, trust me on this one. Make this simple brine with as few ingredients as possible. You don't have to make it on the stove. You don't have to chill it down, and it's super simple. And the secret ingredient is apple cider vinegar. Now, I know you don't normally drink apple cider vinegar on a regular basis, or at least I hope not, but it actually makes an incredible brine. Your turkey is not going to taste anything like apple cider vinegar. It's just going to taste really, really good. So add a gallon of apple cider vinegar to the cooler. Now, the turkey's already in there, and that's fine. All right, apple cider vinegar is cheap. Three to four dollars a gallon at the grocery store, even at a nice grocery store. And if you're making a whole lot of brine, more than about five or six gallons, I would get two gallons of apple cider vinegar. Okay, now we're gonna add just a regular gallon of water. We're getting close to the level of brine we need, so I'm going to add one more gallon of water. And now you'll see our turkey has started to float. I'm going to stop just short of a gallon. And see, I can push my turkey all the way down into the water. So that is as much brine as we need. Okay, our turkey is now going to come out of the brine and back onto our pan while we finish the brine. Now I've got just shy of three gallons of liquid in the brine, but in order to chill the brine, we're going to be adding a 10 pound bag of ice, which is basically one gallon plus just shy of one quart of water. So we're going to end up with a total of four gallons of liquid for our brine. So we're going to use that figure, that four gallons of liquid, our three gallons that are in here, plus the 10 pound bag of ice, to calculate our salt and sugar content for the brine. This is Morton's Coarse Kosher Salt, and this is the ideal salt for brining. If you are using Morton's Coarse Kosher Salt, which is available in virtually every grocery store in the country, you are going to use one and a half cups of this salt for every gallon of liquid. Now, it's okay to use table salt if that's the only thing you have, but do not use iodized table salt, because what that's going to do is fill our turkey with iodine. And I really don't want an iodine-basted turkey for Thanksgiving, do you? So, non-iodized table salt is okay at a ratio of three-fourths of a cup per gallon. There's also diamond crystal kosher salt. The ratio for that salt is two cups of diamond crystal kosher salt per gallon of liquid. But, Morton's coarse kosher salt is going to work. Now I've got four gallons of liquid. One and a half cups per gallon means six cups of salt. And it just so happens that an entire box of Morton's kosher salt is in fact six cups. So we're going to just empty the entire box of salt into our liquid right now. Now, we are also going to add some sugar to the brine. 
The sugar does a couple of things, but the most important thing it does is help counteract a little bit of the salt. Uh, we don't want our turkey to taste salty, we just want it to taste perfectly seasoned and juicy. And our brine is working to actually infuse the turkey with moisture, and the salt is the vehicle that carries the moisture into the turkey cell. So we are just using the sugar as a way to counteract the salt to make sure our turkey doesn't taste too salty. And at one-fourth of a cup of sugar per gallon, with four gallons of brine, that's one cup of sugar. You can also use brown sugar, and that's delightful too. Okay, so once my box of salt finishes emptying, we're going to stir it up. Now most recipes for brine on the internet say that you have to heat up the brine in order to get the salt effectively dissolved. And you know what? That is malarkey. With a little bit of arm power, you can get all that salt dissolved into the brine. So get the biggest whisk you have and just start whisking. Now, it may take you a couple of minutes or three minutes, but trust me, in the time it saves from heating up a brine, cooling it, putting it in your refrigerator to chill, this is much better alternative. It's actually okay if some of the salt crystals don't get dissolved because they will continue to dissolve in the brine as the brine sits. And as the ice that we're about to add to it melts and dilutes the solution, it will be able to take up more salt anyway. So just get in there, stir around really good. Most of your salt's going to get dissolved. Our next step is to add a 10 pound bag of ice. And as I mentioned before, a 10 pound bag of ice is actually a gallon plus almost a quart of water in liquid form. But not all of our ice is going to melt. Even over a long brining period, up to 18 hours, you're still going to see ice in the brine. That's a good thing though, it means that our brine is staying at a very cold temperature. Now stir this up a little bit, that's going to lower the overall temperature of the brine. And you want to add your turkey breast side down, just like we did when we thawed it. Now, that turkey floats as we learned earlier. So to keep it submerged, we are going to add yet another 10 pound bag of ice, a closed one. And try to get one that doesn't have any rips or tears in the top of it, just to make sure we're not going to dilute our brine any more than is necessary. And now our lid goes on the top. Now, if the lid to your cooler won't fit, just drape a blanket across the top of it. That'll provide plenty of insulation. There is still going to be a lot of ice here, even after a lengthy brine. Now, you want to brine for one hour per pound of turkey. That's a 12 pound turkey in there, so it's going to brine for 12 hours. And you really need to work on your timing as you plan this out, based on the time that you're going to eat. Your turkey is going to take anywhere from an hour and a half to two and a half hours to roast. You're also going to want to let it rest for 15 to 30 minutes too. So count on probably about three hours of cooking time before you can serve. Then we know we've got an hour per pound of brining time, and we had about 30 minutes per pound of thawing time. So do your math. You don't want to leave the people at your kitchen table waiting for their Thanksgiving turkey, and you don't want to serve the turkey ice cold. But a little bit of careful calculation will reward you in the end with an accurate serving time for your turkey. So I'm going to bed. Now comes to the pan that we cook our turkey in. If you're cooking a giant turkey and you don't cook very often, you may not have a pan in your cabinet that is large enough to handle a turkey. In that case, you don't have to go out and spend a whole bunch of money to buy a roasting pan. They sell those disposable aluminum foil roasting pans uh, at the grocery store for a few dollars, and you can get one of those. But if you do use one of those, you're going to need to set it on top of a regular cookie sheet because those are not sturdy enough to hold a 12, 14, 15 pound turkey, all right? So make sure you get one of those pans and put it on top of a regular baking sheet. But if you do cook pretty often, you probably have something in your kitchen right now, other than a roasting pan, that'll work just fine. Just a regular high-sided pan like this will work. Now, also there's not actually a roasting pan on the inside of this, but technically that's okay. A roasting pan lifts the turkey off the bottom of the pan 
and allows the turkey to cook entirely by convection. That means the air around the turkey is what transfers the heat into it. If the turkey is sitting smack dab on the bottom of the pan, the bottom of the turkey is cooking by conduction, which means that the pan is directly transferring the heat to the bottom of the bird. And that means it's going to get all black and crisp and you're going to have burnt bits all over your pan. But you know what? You don't eat the bottom part of the turkey anyway. I have roasted plenty of birds directly on the bottom of a pan. So, if you've got a pan like this that the bird will fit in, that's perfectly fine. If you've got a broiling pan, a two-part broiling pan like this, as long as it's got a little lip around the edge to keep the juices from running out, you can set the turkey right on top of that. Now again, the bottom of the turkey is going to get cooked a little bit more by conduction because we've got a pretty big surface area on this uh, broiling pan, but it's still going to work just fine. Another option is to take your baking sheet and take a regular cooling rack. The cooling rack acts as your roasting rack. It keeps the bird off the bottom of the pan. Now it's possible you're going to get a lot of juices in this that might slosh around when you pull it out. So you're going to have to be extra careful if you use this setup because you will risk spilling hot juices when the turkey comes out of the oven. But it will still suffice. Alright, my turkey, which is 12 pounds, has been in my brine for 12 hours. So it's about time to start getting the turkey ready for the oven. Now, the first thing you need to do is preheat your oven to 500 degrees. And yes, you heard me correctly, 500 degrees. I'll explain that in a bit. And you're also going to probably need to move the rack of your oven down to the lower first or second racks. A turkey is a big thing and it accommodates a lot of the space in the oven. So you definitely need to make sure your turkey will fit. And it's better to change the rack when it's cool than when it's 500 degrees, right? Right. Okay, so let's get our turkey out of the brine. We're going to take the lid off here. And my 10 pound bag of ice that's been weighing my turkey down is still pretty much fully frozen, which is good news. I'm going to grab a spoon to help me kind of lift that turkey up out of that brine. If you've got any little cuts on your hand, you will certainly notice them when you dip them into an acidic, salty solution, right? And just drain the brine off of the bird. Now you don't want to rinse the brine off because that is your seasoning for the skin. So all you want to do at this point is take some paper towels and just pat the bird dry. Now if you've got one of these little thermometer things, a little red or white dot on the inside, you're not going to use that to determine whether or not the turkey is done, because it's not accurate. But if you pull it out, you're just going to leave a big old hole in the breast to allow all of the juices to leak out while the turkey bakes. So leave it in there and just completely ignore it. You're going to remove it after the turkey has been removed from the oven and has cooled or been allowed to sit for about 10 to 15 minutes so that the turkey soaks up all of its juices back into the meat cells. That way we don't end up with a dry turkey. And we work so hard with our brine to make sure our turkey isn't dry. All right, the next step is to make our turkey breastplate. Alton Brown is the one who introduced me to this technique, and it's a great technique. Take yourself a square of aluminum foil and fold it in half like diagonally, basically, to make yourself a triangle of foil. Now, place this onto the turkey breast, like so, and just kind of fold it around so that it makes a good fit. You're doing this now because you are going to add it to the turkey later on to prevent the turkey skin from burning and to prevent the breast from overcooking. And you don't want to have to press it onto a turkey that's 500 degrees, right? Right, of course. All right, so just remove the breastplate, set it aside because you're going to need it later. Next thing that we're going to do is spread some canola oil or any other oil with a relatively high smoke point all over the skin of the turkey. And this is going to help with browning. There's also a layer of subcutaneous fat that's like directly underneath the skin on the turkey, and that's going to brown the turkey from the inside out while we have it at 500 degrees. And uh, our canola oil on top is going to brown it from the outside in. So get that canola oil all into those cracks all over the turkey. All right, good. Now when our oven comes up to temperature, we're ready to put the bird in.
A few more things while we wait for the oven to come to temperature. Once you have pulled your turkey out of the brine, you have to discard the brine. It cannot be reused. It is actually no longer brine. A lot of the salt and sugar and moisture content of that brine have been taken into the turkey. It actually weighs quite a bit more right now than it did when we put it into the brine. And also, all sorts of cellular compounds have come out of the turkey and are now floating around in the brine. And you do not want to brine a new turkey with all those denatured proteins and things like that that are now floating in the brine. So discard the brine. However, it is perfectly acceptable to brine more than one type of poultry at the same time. You can have a turkey and some Cornish game hens or a roasting hen or a pheasant or anything you want as long as it all brines together. You can pull them out of the brine whenever the time is appropriate for each individual item. All right, let's talk about stuffing. Don't do it. The whole concept with stuffing was quaint maybe 50 or 60 years ago. But now we've realized that all that stuffing does is absorb the raw juices that start to soak out of the turkey as it cooks. And it's really hard to get stuffing cooked all the way through to the proper temperature to sterilize it without overcooking your meat. So just don't stuff your turkey. Make yourself some dressing separately. You can stuff the turkey after it comes out of the oven if you really want to see that stuffed turkey. But do not cook the stuffing inside the turkey. It's just not sanitary or safe. And it's also perfectly acceptable, however, for you to stuff the interior cavity of the bird right now with aromatics. And generally, when I make a Thanksgiving turkey or a Christmas turkey, I'll stuff some rosemary and sliced apples in there. The apples really complement the light apple flavor that we get from the apple cider vinegar. However, I'm also going to confess that I really don't notice that much of a taste difference with aromatic stuffed into the cavity than without. So do it if you like for it to enhance the smell of your kitchen, because it certainly will, but that flavor is really not going to soak into that turkey as much as we'd like to think it would. Now, trussing. To truss a turkey basically just means to tie it up so that the bird looks formal. It, it keeps the legs high, it keeps the wing tips in, and that's really just purely for show. You don't have to do it. Uh, there are a number of things that you can do to improve the overall uh, image of the turkey. You can take the wings and kind of bend them underneath the turkey to hold them in place and that gets them out of the way. You can also cut off the wings if you want. A lot of people don't eat the turkey wings. The meat's not brilliant. But you can just tuck them away like that. I actually cannot find my kitchen twine, so I'm not going to be able to tie my legs here to make the turkey all nice and pretty and formal looking, but really, ultimately, it doesn't matter. So my oven has just beeped that it's ready for me. We're going to go ahead and put our turkey in. And we're going to put the legs to the back of the oven where the heat is greatest radiates off the metal part of the back of the oven, and it's a really harsh heat. Our breast is the most delicate area, so we're going to keep it facing forward to the front door of the oven, where the glass doesn't radiate quite as much heat. So, in goes our bird. So we let our turkey go at 500 degrees for 30 minutes. And what happens is this initial blast of heat is going to render that subcutaneous fat out and really crisp up the skin and give us some nice browning. After 30 minutes, we're going to turn the heat down for the rest of the roasting time. Now let's talk about other ways that you can prepare your turkey, because some of you are probably tuning into this video because you know me and you're wanting to see what kind of crazy other things that I do with a turkey rather than just put it in the oven. Now you can fry a turkey. I have all sorts of crazy stories about turkey frying. The very first time I attempted it, I tried to do it on my stovetop and I actually set my kitchen on fire. So never try to fry a turkey inside the house. Preferably, don't even do it in your garage, because the oil can really foam up and go crazy depending on the moisture content and temperature of your turkey. So, if you're going to fry a turkey, fry it outside. But I do recommend that you brine a turkey before you fry it. It will be that much better. And honestly, a deep fried brined turkey is probably one of the most delicious things I've ever eaten in my entire life. You can also smoke turkeys. Uh, but unlike other meats, barbecues, where you smoke it low and slow, that's dangerous to do with a turkey because it's so big that it takes so long at a relatively low temperature, you can have a buildup of dangerous bacteria. So it's best to start a turkey off at a higher temperature, get it cooked well past 140 or 150 degrees, 
then you can get your temperature a little bit lower and concentrate that smoke to get the turkey fully cooked on the inside. Smoking is kind of an iffy way, but like I said before, as long as you cook your turkey to the proper temperature, which we're gonna talk about in a second, you will be safe and you don't have to worry about poisoning yourself and your Thanksgiving guests. Now that looks fantastic already, and it's only been roasting for 30 minutes at 500 degrees. Now it is time for us to put on our breastplate and stick in our thermometer. Okay, so we take our breastplate that we molded earlier and just set it gently onto the turkey. Now the thermometer is actually going to hold that breastplate on. Let's talk about thermometers because you cannot roast a turkey without a thermometer. That whole Martha Stewart of 45 minutes a pound, that doesn't exist, all right? You have got to cook a turkey until the thickest part of the breast is 161 degrees. Now, how do you determine that? With a thermometer, and there are two types. The best type to use is called a probe or a remote probe thermometer. The probe sticks into the meat, but the registry where it tells you your temperature stays outside of the oven where you can easily monitor the progress of your turkey. That's the best kind to have. Unfortunately, it's also the most expensive. One of these can cost you 20 or 30 bucks. But I use mine all the time, especially when I barbecue, so it is worth the investment if you can swing for it. The other type of thermometer, which is cheaper, is just the simple probe thermometer that has a dial on the front. Now, do not try to use a digital readout thermometer. That cannot stay inside the oven. It has to be stuck in and pulled out. And as soon as you pull that out, all your juices are gonna come out. So you have to have a dial type thermometer that is oven safe that can stay inside the oven. The drawback to this is that you have to keep opening the oven door and shine your little flashlight in there if your oven light's not bright enough to determine the temperature of the turkey. And every time you open the oven door, heat gets out and it takes your bird longer to cook. So you can use this in a pinch, but the probe thermometer is best. So we're gonna take this probe and careful because your turkey is hot, you might want to give yourself a little hot pad to use here. And you're gonna insert the probe through the breastplate that we've just made out of foil into the thickest part of the turkey. Now I'm gonna take the breastplate off for a second just so you can watch the, the location. You're gonna push this straight back toward the inside of the turkey. Don't point it this direction toward the breastbone. Don't point it down toward the ribs. If the tip of the thermometer, which is the part that reads the temperature, is up against a bone, it's gonna give you a false temperature because a bone conducts heat more quickly than uh, the lean meat does. So make sure you stick the probe directly straight back into the turkey so that the tip of the thermometer is resting basically in the very center of the breast. All right, so I'm gonna do that right now and very good. Now our breastplate is held on by our thermometer and it's telling me the inside of the turkey is 129 degrees, 130 degrees. We're actually going for an internal temperature of 161 degrees in the breast. At that temperature, the breast is perfectly cooked but still juicy and the dark meat, the thigh and the leg, is also going to be perfectly done, not underdone, which is very important. All right, back into a 350 degree oven. Same direction with the legs pointed toward the back of the oven. Now, it may only take my turkey another hour, sometimes less, to reach that 161 degree done temperature. Depends on the size of the turkey, depends on how long it's been in the brine, depends on the internal temperature of the turkey when it goes into the oven. There's really no way to pinpoint exactly how long. But it's probably gonna take anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour and 15 minutes of additional roasting time before this 12 pound bird is done. But we just have to wait till we hit that 161 degree mark. Now let's talk for a second about basting. Basting is a myth! Don't do it! Basting does not contribute any moisture to the inside of the turkey meat. All it does is make your turkey skin soggy and wet. Basting is the most ridiculous myth in the kitchen ever, ever, ever. All it does is waste temperature when you open the oven door to suck up the juices and drench the turkey with it. It doesn't do anything for the turkey. So throw away your turkey baster. You do not need it. Leave that door closed and let the turkey do its thing. And that sound means our turkey is at 161 degrees. Now, if you've got a probe thermometer, you have to remove the turkey carefully from the oven 
so you don't like drop the thermometer everywhere because it's attached to this other unit, right? Oh, that smells good. Okay, I'm just going to set it here for the moment. I'm going to grab my thermometer and go ahead and transfer it over. All right, perfect. Now, let it sit there. Don't mess with it. That turkey needs to sit and relax for 15, 20, preferably 30 minutes before it's ready to carve. If you try to carve into it right now, all of the delicious juices are just going to run out into the pan and the turkey will turn dry. And we worked really hard to make sure that it was moist and tender. So, I'm going to give this turkey 30 minutes. I'm going to rest a little bit of aluminum foil over it to kind of keep it warm. And don't worry. It's going to stay warm. It's not going to go cold on you. This turkey is screaming hot right now. And you'll notice, leave the thermometer in there. If you pull that out again, our juices are going to flow out that hole. You'll notice that the internal temperature of the turkey is continuing to rise. It's at 163 right now, and I took it out at 161. So just loosely tent the turkey with foil. Don't do it tightly because then the skin is going to steam and turn soggy on you and you don't want that to happen. So, let's give this turkey a little bit and then it's time to dig in. Alright, I've let my turkey sit for half an hour and it is time to carve this bad boy. Take off that foil tent, remove the thermometer probe and the breastplate. And if you've got, oh wow, that looks delicious. And if you've got one of these weird turkey thermometers, the plastic ones that were left in there, now is the time to take it out. Look at that, it didn't even raise. How interesting. All right, now the turkey is ready to carve. I actually do not have a house full of people waiting on this turkey right now. I'm the only one here. So I'm just going to carve into here just a little bit and let you see how flavorful and juicy and moist this is on the inside. Now that is Thanksgiving turkey porn, if I have ever seen it. Look how juicy that white meat is. And you can bet that the dark meat is gonna be even more juicy and delicious. Oh, oh wow, that is good. Mm. Juicy, tender, delicious, perfectly seasoned turkey. Your family is going to absolutely go nuts for this. So I hope I have dispelled some of your worst nightmares about cooking a Thanksgiving turkey. It's really not that hard. Brining takes a little bit longer, but the payoff is extraordinary. Hit my website, binstar.com, for the full step-by-step -step process about creating the perfect Thanksgiving turkey, as well as plenty of other recipes for Thanksgiving to impress your loved ones. Thanks so much for letting me share in this Thanksgiving time with you. I really do appreciate it. I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving with the people in your life who mean everything to you. I'm thankful for you that you have helped me get as far as I've gotten so far and have a wonderful and happy holiday season. Thanks for watching.